Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Is anybody out there? Good morning. Good morning. All right. Good morning. Um, you know, we're going to continue this series um, talking about who is Jesus. And, you know, we sang a song um, at the very beginning talking about ancient of days. And, you know, the fact is, I don't know if you've ever noticed it, but doesn't, doesn't it seem like there's lots of names in the Bible that all refer to God? Right? Lots of names, right? Lots of, and the, the really important thing for you to know is those names have lots of different meanings. They're powerful. Just keep that in mind. So whenever you're singing a song or you're reading a passage of Scripture and there's this name that refers to God, just keep in mind that's really, really critical. It's something that you should, you should read and hold on to, all right? We're going to continue in this series talking about who is Jesus. And the fact is, when you read through the Bible, Jesus has all of these names. There's just tons and tons of names about, uh, that, rec that recognize, that call to, uh, that Jesus even uses, that refer to who he is. I want to remind you that you'll find a card in the rack in front of you. I want to encourage you to take that card out of there and take notes um, as we uh, continue through this series. Um, you know, uh, I have shared this before, but, but it's worth sharing again just because I think this guy's really, really good. We were, actually, we were talking about this in prayer group this morning, talking about all these different people who have, have had such an impact on our spiritual, spiritual life. And, and this is one of the people uh, that, I've, that I've really grown to admire over the years in ministry. His name is Philip Yancey, and uh, he's an author and speaker. Um, although he doesn't do much of it anymore, his health's taken a, a really bad turn, and so he's been limited in what he does. But he wrote a book called The Jesus I Never Knew. Has anybody ever heard of that? The Jesus I Never Knew. Great book. Just a really, really good book. And he tells a story in there about a saltwater aquarium that he kept in his youth. How many of you have um, aquariums right now? Do you have an aquarium at home? Okay. How many of you have, a, have ever seen a saltwater aquarium? They're high maintenance. They are high rather than fresh water, right? But he talks about the fact that it was no easy task to manage this aquarium. It was necessary for him to run portable chemo like a, a portable chemical laboratory in his house so he could monitor the nitrate levels and the ammonia content. Yeah, you're loving chemistry class about right now, aren't you? Right? But he pumped in vitamins and antibiotics and sulfur drugs and enough enzymes to make rock grow in this saltwater tank. He filtered the water through glass fibers and charcoal. He exposed it to ultraviolet light. And with all this energy he poured into providing for the fish, you would think at least the fish would be grateful. The fish were worse than cats. Now, no offense. Okay, so. But the fish only knew the emotion of fear. Mr. Yancey says he would open the lid and he would drop food in there on a regular schedule three times a day. And each time, what do you think the fish did? Right? He couldn't convince them that he really cared about them. And then he explains this in his book. He says, to my fish, I was a deity. I was too large for them. My actions were too incomprehensible. My acts of mercy they saw as cruelty, my attempts at healing, they viewed as destruction. To change their perceptions, I began to see would require a form of incarnation. In other words, becoming a fish. I would have to become a fish and speak to them in a language they would understand. Now, this morning, what I want to take a look at is how God managed to do something similar to all of us as humans. Just how God managed to, to push past our fear and become identifiable with us, with me, with you. Over and over in the New Testament, the various writers claim that Jesus was indeed God in the flesh. But, but what did Jesus actually say about himself? One clue that we have comes from a favorite title that crossed Jesus' lips in reference to himself repeatedly. He referred to himself as the Son of Man. 
But what does that mean? What does that title, what does Son of Man actually mean? Not only for Jesus, but what does it mean for you and for me? And so here's the first thing I want to talk about this morning as we look at this. The first thing is, as Son of Man, this title, Jesus was saying he was fulfilling prophecy. That was Jesus' own claim about himself. Going back to the Old Testament, to the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. This is what we read. Daniel writes, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man. Coming with the clouds of heaven, he approached the, huh, we sang about this, ancient of days, and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nation, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. With the phrase son of man, this phrase son of man, it appears in other places in the Old Testament. And this passage in Daniel is the only one that specifically makes re reference to the coming and promised Messiah of Israel. Now, now here's a story, in case, in case you're a little unfamiliar with it. The prophet Daniel is making this contrast between kingdoms. Okay, that's a feature of the book of Daniel. Uh, the kingdom of the Son of Man and that kingdom, he says, will last forever, but there are four other kingdoms that he talks about in the book of Daniel. He talks about the Babylonian kingdom, the Persian kingdom, Greece, and Rome. And those kingdoms are represented in the book of Daniel by four beasts, a lion, a bear, a leopard, and then there's this unarmed, dreadful, and terrible beast, and Daniel says those beasts will not last and see, the Jews had hoped that their coming Messiah would bring about a military challenge, much like these other kingdoms. It would be that kind of military kingdom and challenge all of their occupiers. And in the case of Jesus' day, they were looking for someone to overthrow the Roman Empire. The Jews instead, they refused Jesus when he spoke of the coming kingdom of God because that concept that he spoke about didn't fit their plans. You know what? I, I think a lot of us are perhaps a lot like the nation of Israel. God is fulfilling his purposes and plans while we're attempting to kind of do things our own way. We kind of have, you know, God, that's a good idea, but I got another set of plans. I think it's probably pretty good too. Why don't we try mine? We mistakenly believe that plan will work better. Maybe you've heard the story about a, a mail order company. Remember those? Mail order, well, kind of like Arizona, uh, Amazon, but a long time ago. Mail order companies um, that uh, sent plans uh, for birdhouses. You could get a company to send you a plan for a bird. You can build a birdhouse. And instead of sending this one individual a plans for the birdhouse, they sent him plans for a sailboat. And he tried to put it together, but it just wouldn't work. And he couldn't figure out what kind of bird was going to live in this dumb birdhouse. So he wrote a letter, and he sent the parts back uh, to the people, and they wrote a letter of apology and added a postscript. They said, if you think it was difficult for you, you should have seen the man who got your plans trying to sail a birdhouse. You know, it's, it's also worthy to note the fact that only Jesus, only Jesus use this title of himself. No one else ever called him son of man. In a ministry that lasted three and one half years, Jesus called himself son of man at least somewhere between 70 to 80 times. This must have been an issue of extreme importance to Jesus. Or else, I don't think he would have used that phrase about himself so many times. The term son of man served to reinforce in the minds of his disciples exactly who Jesus was. Not only was he the Son of Man, but based on watching Jesus, the disciples were driven to an inescapable conclusion. And when Jesus asked who people thought he was, what was the answer? What was the answer? From Matthew 16. 
13 through 16, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked? Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. See, Jesus is fulfilling prophecy about this coming Messiah. He's also demonstrating to his disciples, to the nation of Israel, that he is this long-awaited and promised Son of Man, God in the flesh. But there's something else that Jesus is affirming in terms of exactly who he is by referring to himself as a Son of Man. That phrase, Son of Man, refers to Jesus as being fully human. Fully human. John 3, 13, we read, No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. But really, what in the world is Jesus saying here? I think, I think as I read this, Jesus is saying he was born to Mary in Bethlehem. He's affirming to us that God has come to be among us for the first time in human history, his flesh and blood. We also have affirmed by the, the, the Apostle John, just a few chapters before uh, this one in John chapter 3, we read these words. They'll sound familiar to some of us. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. There is uh, someone by the name of Athenaeus. Does that name ring any bells? Have you ever heard that name? Athenaeus is called by some. He's really referred to as the father of orthodoxy as it relates to what it means to believe in the message of Jesus Christ. And some may ask why he didn't. This is what Athenaeus says, said. Some may ask, why did he not manifest himself by means of other and nobler parts of creation? such as the sun or moon or stars or fire or air, instead of as a mere man? The answer is this, Athenaeus continues. The Lord did not come to make a display. He came to heal and to teach suffering people. For one who wanted to make a display, the thing would have been to just appear and dazzle the beholders. But for him who came to heal, to teach, the way was not merely to dwell here, but to put himself at the disposal of those who needed him. Don't miss this. Friends, don't miss this. Jesus was human, completely human, like you and I. Jesus' central purpose as the Son of Man, according to Luke 19.10, was to seek and to save what was lost. Think about it. Jesus was part of God's plan to infiltrate and move among his own creation in a manner initially that would not cause a stir. He did this in order that he might actually change his own creation's eternal destiny. God's brilliant. It was his plan all along. Has anybody ever heard the name King Abdullah? Does that sound familiar to you? King Abdullah. King Abdullah II, actually, of Jordan. He would often disguise himself and mingle with his subjects. His rationale for this unorthodox approach was so that he could better understand and serve his people, Jordanian citizens. And taking on the character of an ordinary old Arab man, he appeared in public with a fake white beard, wearing the traditional Jordan, uh, Jordanian kufa and the Arabic white dress. And while so disguised, the king walked around to government buildings without security and was not noticed. While waiting in a long line, he engaged people in conversation and listened to their points of view. And such incognito appearances marked this monarch's reign, going back to when he first assumed the throne in 1999. He once disguised himself as an old man while visiting a hospital. Another time, he circled around Amman behind the wheel of a taxi cab. Can you imagine? This king's driving a little taxi cab around, uh, around the capital city of Jordan. 
Still another time he passed himself off as a television reporter trying to cover a story at a duty-free shop. And according to a reporter, Costa Tadros, I think that being in disguise and going around as a normal civilian to listen to their problems and know more about their needs is a good thing. I think it would make a good movie, said the king. Now, while he did this many years ago, now there are Jordanian government employees who've learned not to take any chances. They started to spend time really looking in people's faces, fearing that they might meet the king in disguise. Jesus came in disguise. <laughs> Jesus was intentional in coming in disguise as a human, claiming himself to be the son of man. It helped him to identify with the struggles of all of humanity. He stepped through space and time, put himself in human form because he wanted to know you. He wanted to know me. I, I love what um, Archbishop Biz, uh, Desmond Tutu wrote about Jesus' arrival and life on earth as fully human. He said, there's nothing that might be called otherworldly about the ministry of Jesus. He scandalized the religious leaders of his day, the prim and proper ones, because he consorted with the social and religious pariahs of his day. The tax collectors who were despised and hated because they were considered to be collaborators with Rome. His friends were ladies of easy virtue who went about with uncovered heads, who made public spectacles of themselves at parties, clutching the feet of strange young men and weeping over them and wiping them with their long hair. Such were his friends, the ones who were looked down upon. No wonder one of the favorite titles for Jesus today, which captivates so many, is calling him the man of others. And although Bishop Tutu didn't say this, I wonder if maybe son of man is a reference to being a man for others. Friends, the son of man fulfilled prophecy. The son of man was fully human. Here's the last thing I want us to look at this morning and consider the Son of Man, Jesus, he was destined to die. Recall what Jesus asked his disciples to tell him. Jesus asked his disciples to tell him what? What other people were what? Saying about him, right? And do you remember what Peter finally spoke up when Jesus said, but what do you say? Peter said what? He said, you are the Christ the Son of the living God. And there's a similar passage that comes to us from Luke 9. Not only does Peter answer that Jesus is the Christ and the Son of the living God, but then Jesus says this. Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone. And he said, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, teachers of the law, and he must be killed, and on the third day, raised to life. Jesus, in coming to earth, Jesus punched a one-way ticket. And I don't know how many of you do any flying. From what I remember, I haven't done much of this lately, but one-way tickets aren't really, there's not like a whole lot cheaper. <laughs> one-way tickets can actually be somewhat expensive. And this trip would cost Jesus, the Son of Man, his life. And Jesus knew it. It's also worth noting that in talking about what must happen, that he must be killed, Jesus dropped the following truth in verse 23 of the same chapter when he said this. Then he said to them, all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, 
take up their cross daily and follow me. Friends, the audience hearing those words that day would have immediately known. Are you saying what I think you're saying? Are you saying that I have to be ready to die? That's exactly what Jesus was saying. It would seem that not only Jesus was destined to die, but it's very clear that Jesus is also saying that those who choose to follow him must be ready for what? To die. To give up their very lives. Because we too, in a similar matter, Jesus says we are destined to die. Now, the only example I could think of wherein people identify with the one who's destined to die are the characters of the Hunger Games movies. And that was the only connection I could make in, in real life. You know, the one thing that gets me in each of these movies is not only the fight that these characters in these post apocalyptic dystopian movies put up themselves and resisting their decided by lottery fate, fighting to the death, but there are lengths that certain characters go to to survive what certainly appears to be an impossibility to survive. There's no way to avoid their destiny. They will die. However, it's also fascinating to see how the citizens of the capital and how many districts? How many? How many districts are there? Hunger Games people. 13 districts, that's it. But it's fascinating to see how they will essentially pick, they will pick who they want to live, a favorite of the crowds, and in an unavoidable parallel. They still have... That's who they want. They, they, they want that person to live. But there's one thing I find incredibly fascinating in each one of those stories, each one of those movies. Someone else will typically sacrifice themselves for someone else. Over and over you see it in the movies, in those stories. Friends, that's not unique or special to the Hunger Games. That's not originally coming to us from those books and movies. In fact, we're told in 1 John chapter 3, verse 10, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And then John comes back to that a little bit later in the epistle, this book, and he says in chapter 4, verses 9 and 10, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our lives. Jesus was a son of man. And he did what only God could do. He became one of his own creatures to save them from themselves. I want to close this morning with a story that I heard years ago that fascinated me. It's just a, just a brief little story, actually. There's a gentleman by the name of John Howard Griffin. And uh, he never believed, he, he thought that it would be impossible for those who lived in our nation, who were white, who could never understand what African Americans were going through unless he became like them. And so in 1959, he darkened his skin with medication. He sat under sun lamps and stained himself. And then he traveled through the American South. His book, 
called Black Like Me. It really began to help many people in our country to better understand what segregation did, how it shriveled the soul and spirit, faced daily, dealt with daily by people of color. Jesus Christ became like us. He began to look like we look, took on our features. An incarnation, an incarnation that's evidence that God understands our plight. As a matter of fact, in a prophecy, a prophetic word from the book of Isaiah, we read this. Centuries before Jesus came, he was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. The Son of Man. He identifies with us because he became one of us. Would you pray with me? Father, we are amazed by your brilliance, by your love for us. God, that you put into motion this plan to come and be amongst your creation, to make it possible for those who would come to you through your son to see your face, to know you, to become part of your forever family. But God, this is not just something for us. As wonderful that it is, and as wonderful as that is, God, this relationship, this being able to identify with you, God, this is for the world. Lord, there are many who do not know who you are. God, give us opportunity just to live our lives in a way that causes someone to wonder what is different about who we are, why we do the things that we do, why we behave the ways that we do, why we seem to love no matter what. Lord, may we be able to say uh, with humility and honesty that is because the Son of Man came and put on human flesh, showed us uh, what, uh, what it meant to, to live and to move among humanity to sacrifice his own life. We love you. We thank you for this sacrifice for this model, this example. Jesus, the Son of Man. We pray this in your Son's name. Amen.